Hey folks, this is the Lifting with Lauren attempt at a podcast, episode two, reporting live on Instagram from the frigid cold of Florida, where it is currently 54 degrees Fahrenheit, and I have to wear pants and a jacket, even though a couple days ago it was in the 90s, and uh, you know, yeah, because Florida just does that because it can. Um, so I actually did a very, uh, very uh, last minute poll in my Instagram, and uh, asked... I asked people to vote on what I was going to talk about today, and I'll do that more often because it'll make it easier for me to decide what I'm going to talk about. So um, the vote for today was to talk about starvation mode. So there is a lot to unpack there. By the way, today I'm training shoulders. So today might be a, a much shorter workout, but the problem is that starvation mode is a very big, big topic. So um, I have to give a lot of background in order to be able to discuss that. And also, I'm at home. This is my home gym, obviously. I don't train people here. Um, and so my neighbors might think that I'm a psycho because I'm talking to myself. So you're welcome. Um, anyway, so I guess first thing is let me give a little bit of background of kind of what I know about starvation mode. I'm trying to keep track of what I'm doing. What was my first warm-up exercise? Oh, yeah, that. Um, anyway, so um, whenever... I first got into lifting. I was heavy into the bodybuilding community. So this was like uh, 2012, 2013, 2014, and a little bit in 2015. I followed a lot of different bodybuilders and people who were leaders in the bodybuilding community. Um, And then whenever I first started out, you know, I wasn't in college at the time. Um, Oh, I was in college, but I wasn't in college for um, uh, sport and exercise science at the time. So there's a lot of stuff that I really didn't know. Um, and I read the same articles that a lot of other people read that are all bro science based off of science from the 70s and 80s that apparently no one seems to have the capacity to um, update, (laughs) Uh, even though we know a lot more since then. So I remember one time having an argument with my dad um, about whether or not wearing a one of those like um, plastic bag-looking sauna suits would help you burn more fat. BT dubs, they don't. But at the time, I thought that they did because you sweated more. So obviously, your fat would go down more. No, that's not how that works. So anyway, (laughs) I've learned a lot since then. But luckily, early on, I got exposed to some really intelligent people, people who were in the research field or who were closely connected to the research field. So like... um, so he Lee, uh, Dr. Brett Contreras, um, Eric Cressy, but the big one as far as nutrition goes was Dr. Lane Wharton. So um, when I was in college, whenever I would be waiting between classes, I would go to the cafeteria and I would actually um, sit and while I was eating or hanging out and waiting, I would watch uh, these videos that Dr. Norton used to put on um on YouTube, and he would break down all these different types of topics. It's the first, like, he was the first vlog or podcast or whatever I have I had ever listened to, and I was just fascinated by it. I learned so much because the guy really is a genius, and I know that he can be a little angry sometimes, but um, I learned a lot of stuff from listening to him. And at the time, there was this concept that was being circulated about metabolic damage. So when people talk about starvation mode, um, a lot of times they're referring to metabolic damage and um, the implications of that. So metabolic damage is this idea that, at least this is what was thought at the time. So this is like 2013 when this was being circulated. God, it's almost seven years ago. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Um, anyway, so um, what metabolic damage... Oh, man, I gotta do a hollow body hold. I hate those. Um, <clears throat> quick note on hollow body holds. They actually... I gotta read more on this, but supposedly hollow body holds will actually engage both the internal and external layer, layer of the abdominals. So they're good for women who are um, postnatal because uh, they help to uh, lessen diastasis recti. Just so you know. In case any of you dudes out there plan on having kids. <clears throat> so anyway, um, metabolic damage is the concept that the body actually will um, change your the way that you metabolize because you have less food available or because you've gone through multiple periods of dieting. That's a very, very rough um, 
description of that. But basically, um, the the thought at the time was a lot of these women who are in the bodybuilding community, um, you would start to see that they would go through multiple dieting phases for shows, um, and their bodies would start to be damaged, and they would have a harder time recovering from their diets. So, for example, um, it's happened a lot in the bikini world because bikini was starting to get big around like 2010, 11, 12, and then 13, which is even bigger now, and it looks totally different than it used to. But for the bikini, divi bikini division of bodybuilding, um, what would happen a lot is um, women would diet down for a show, and um, when they were dieting down, um, you know, you'd get to the point where uh, you know, your weight doesn't move anymore and you would have to diet. You'd have to lower your calories even more. Um, you know, and obviously there's a, that, that whole idea of clean eating and crap was really big back then, which I guess people still try to adhere to that. But, um, basically they would have to cut down back calories more and more and more. And then right after a show, a lot of times women would not only gain their weight back that they had lost prior to the show, they would gain even more weight back. So um, that's one idea as far as like metabolic damage goes. And um, they would feel like they're not eating as many calories. So, um, you know, that, there's a number of reasons behind that. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But um, so one, well, what would happen after that is that as these women go to, to diet for the next show, they would have to cut their calories back even more. So there's that kind of that metabolic damage idea and that kind of goes along. It's kind of synonymous a little bit with the starvation mode idea. So the idea of starvation mode is that um, a person can be eating so few calories that their body won't lose weight. Um, on a surface level, let me just go ahead and put it out there. No, <laughs> no, doesn't work that way. If you're eating fewer calories than your body needs, your body will lose weight. It will take it from somewhere. Your body wants to survive. Your body is designed in order to survive. So um, if you're eating fewer calories than your body needs, it's either going to take it from your fat, it's going to take it from your muscle, whatever. Case in point, starving kids in Africa or third world countries, whatever. You pick a country. It doesn't matter. Starving children. They're eating less than their body needs. They're really friggin' skinny. And to the point that they actually have bloated bellies. That ain't fat. <laughs> um, their body is not storing fat because they are not getting enough food. And there's a little um, little science background here. Um, thermodynamics. So the way that this works is energy is neither created nor destroyed. You cannot create energy out of nowhere and then store it. So the reason that you have fat stores is your body is actually taking broken down um, glucose and other thingies and it's storing it as fat essentially um, or it's taking it converting it into muscle if you're exercising and you have enough protein so um, if you're not taking in enough calories your body can't store it I mean where is it going to get the energy from is it going to pull it out of the sky is it going to pull it out of your app up your butt I mean like where is it going to come from so no it doesn't work that way your body will not store extra fat because you're eating less um, but also your your weight loss like kind of on the, the, the moderate side your weight loss is not going to stall because you're eating less simply based on the fact that you're eating less so I, that's another thing I gotta talk about in a second so um, the two concepts that are heavy into this are binge eating and um, metabolic adaptation but from a different perspective so i'm going to go back to the metabolic t metabolic adaptation idea so <clears throat> the idea with metabolic adaptation back in the day um from from my understanding it was a little bit less researched is that five maybe six i'm doing shoulder presses seven i gotta count today because i didn't count on tuesday and like i think i did like <laughs> eight or five or eight repetitions of certain exercises and that wasn't good i'm only using doing one arm at a time because i only have one 20 pound dumbbell at home and i'm too cheap to go buy another one <laughs> um so um the idea back in the day with metabolic adaptation was more that um like things happened inside your body that you really couldn't see that caused your body your metabolism to just change like this idea of metabolism is kind of abstract i think to most people um so they think that meta metabolism is just these little beings that live inside of me and they get to decide 
um, how much energy I expend or store or whatever, and I don't think we really have a firm grasp of what metabolism is. So, here we go. Here's what metabolism is. Metabolism is, is <laughs> this is fire. <laughs> um, metabolism is comprised of, uh, I had a, a spider on my leg for people who are not watching and listening. Um, <laughs> there are four components to metabolism. The biggest one is your I might make some of these terms mixed up, but first one is your basal metabolic rate. That's the one that burns the majority of the calories in your body. So basal metabolic rate is what your body needs essentially to just, like, survive. So uh, I think resting metabolic rate is if you were, like, at rest. So it's, like, slightly more than basal metabolic rate. Basal metabolic rate is just, like, basic um, life functions. If you hear the birds chirping, it's because I'm outside. Um, So, like for your heart to pump, for your body to digest, you know, whatever, just basic functions, that's your basal metabolic rate. And it's going to take up, I think the last percentage that I saw was like 65 to 70% of your daily caloric expenditure is all just basal metabolic rate. So take that into perspective, like 65 to 70% of what your body needs to survive is like something you have zero control over. Okay, so the next part is uh, some of these... um, numbers are going to be a little bit varied it comes because it kind of depends on a number of different factors so this is kind of where your metabolic adaptation comes in the next one is going to be let's say like exercise activity thermogenesis that's called your eat um for some people that's as low as like five percent for some people it can be as high as 20 percent of your daily expenditure simply because you know maybe you're more active throughout the day because of crazy exercise regimen some people who are getting ready for like Ironman and stuff they're exercising literally six to eight hours a day like it's freaking crazy I don't even know how they do that but um so that could expend a crap ton of your energy um but if you're just doing like basic workout like this it's like 10 percent like not even and that's that's part of the reason why increasing your exercise helps a little bit with um like weight loss and stuff but not that much just because you know, it's good for you, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, because obviously, yes, you should. You should be exercising, because there's way more benefits than, than uh, bad things. They need to have a, an equivalent word for benefits. Can somebody type out what that is? <laughs> Go look at the phone in a second. Um, but uh, increasing your exercise will help a little bit with your cal- calorie expenditure, but not nearly as much as controlling how much food you're taking in. Um, the next one is going to be your TF, thermic effective food. That one is really small too. So thermic effective food is just how much energy it takes to, to um, actually break down food. So it's, it's food specific and it actually depends on the type of foods that you take in. Once again, really small percentage, like up to 10% usually. Um, this is, this is like, I know where some people say, oh, well, eating clean causes you to burn more calories. Well, yeah, technically it does like to a small degree. So there is an advantage of eating like more whole foods, um, eating vegetables for from, uh, like, the ground and not as broken down. Um, so, yeah, there's a little bit of effect there. The last one, though, is, is a really, really big one, and this is the one where the adaptation, from the stuff that I've seen, this is where the adaptation comes in, is your NEAT. Other things, too, but NEAT especially. So NEAT is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. NEAT is essentially um, stuff that you're is not voluntary. So um, it was funny. The other day, uh, I, I've been doing YouTube videos and stuff about me trying to gain weight, and uh, I struggle because I'm a little bit of a hyperactive person, and, um, you know, especially if I've been, like, really stressed out and stuff, I have a hard time getting in enough food to be able to gain weight um, because I get really, like, really anxious and I don't want to eat, but also... I figured this was going to happen. Now that we're on this uh, pandemic, like, stay-at-home thing, um, I've been able to eat a lot more. It's been awesome. So I'm, like, sitting. (laughs) Jesus Christ. I was sitting in bed the other day, and I'm, like, (laughs) it's, like, 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, and I'm, like, eating a corn dog (laughs) in bed. My husband's, like, what is wrong with you? I'm, like, what do you mean? He's, like, you have all this energy to, like, run around and do stuff and like you're singing and like what is what is wrong with you i'm like i don't know he's like i'm like exhausted right now it's just me it's like how i'm wired so eating extra food actually for me increases my meat which makes it so hard for me to gain weight so um essentially having the extra calories available i'm counting hold on i think this is 12 
I think it's the 12. <laughs> anyway, lateral raises. Um, so having the extra energy available actually allows your body to um, feel safer, to expend more energy. Really weird. There's another, there's a YouTuber, her name is um, Stephanie Buttermore, and she has issues with um, hunger signals. She had like extreme hunger signals. So she went on, she did this experiment where she just ate until her body would stop telling her she was hungry. So she gained like 50 pounds. But um, she said that she had so much more energy just because of so much food available. Some people are wired that way. Some people are able to take in more food and they're able to just buzz around all over the place. So I'm one of those people. Um, so yeah, that's what neat is. Neat is stuff that you can't really control. It's the twitching and the moving and the singing and the crazy stuff. That's, that's me. Um, so your neat, because it's affected by your food intake, um, that's the part of your metabolism, I think, that adapts the most. So when you think about your bodybuilding competitors and they are needing to adjust their, um, they're needing to adjust their calories in order to be able to continue to gain weight, a couple things are happening. Gatorade and creatine. A couple things are happening. So the first thing that's happening is there's less of them. There's less fat, there's less muscle. So their body actually doesn't need as many calories in order to survive. So basically because you there are less there is less of you, your body doesn't have your basal metabolic rate actually goes down because your body doesn't need the extra calories um, in order to maintain that. Your body has to have a certain number of calories in order to maintain your muscle mass, by the way. Otherwise it starts to, to eat it down. That's what's happened to me. Um, the next thing is though, is that as your um, this is like kind of like the catch-22, I guess. As your um, intake goes down, your need goes down also. So that's another aspect of that metabolic adaptation is like, okay, there's less of me, so I have taken less food. But because I've taken less food, my body naturally expends less energy. So it's like, it's like this crazy, you know, rabbit hole down. Um, and that's why a lot of these women get really, really messed up and they have to stop competing for a number of years. So... That's like the more complicated aspect of um, of metabolic adaptation. I'm gonna count now. Two, three, four. There's something crawling around above my head. I think it's a squirrel. <laughs> this is the joys of working out outside in Florida. <laughs> okay, I don't know how many that was. Um, so when it comes to starvation mode, when people are kind of blaming that for why they're not able to lose weight, part of it could be a metabolic adaptation thing. It could be. Um, that just is completely dependent on the person. Depends on how many times they've dieted. If you look at um, Oprah Winfrey, how she has gone through multiple diets, like crazy diets, and she always gains more weight back. The other aspect of that, this is like kind of going on the rabbit trail, but there's a, there's a ton of, like there's so much complexity surrounding this concept. Um, so, Oprah Winfrey, um, she goes through that whole like adaptation process, takes in less and less calories, and then yo-yos back. Um, there's a couple of theories as to why that is. One of the recent um, bits of research that I have heard of is actually, um, I only have 120, so I gotta do upright rows like one arm at a time. One of the recent bits of research that I had heard of is um, your body when you begin to lose weight, because when you lose weight, you're going to lose muscle mass also. Um, there's kind of no way around it. I really have a hard time like talking and counting at the same time. This kind of hurts. Um, so because you can't really control where, exactly where your body is losing muscle from the, or losing weight from, the only way that you can control or like spare your muscles is to take in more protein. Okay. But, um, even with taking an excess protein and trying to keep your muscle mass high while you're in a caloric deficit, you're still going to lose some muscle. So what will sometimes happen is that when you are done dieting, in quotes, um, your body will kind of get angry at you and it wants you to gain the muscle back. So it will actually increase your hunger signals to eat like a flippin' pig until you gain that muscle mass back. The problem is that while you're gaining that muscle mass back, um, you're getting fat mass back also. That's one of the theories as to why 
people end up like dieting down and then boom, ballooning back up and then dining down and then boom, ballooning. Like every time it's like they get higher and higher and higher. There's got to be, there's more to it than that, I'm sure, but that's just what I've seen recently. So anyway, so there's all of that stuff as far as like metabolic adaptation. It's not because like that's not the starvation mode thing happening. Whenever people are gaining weight back, um, it's not because you ate 60 calories that your body gave up on you and decided to start storing calories. That's not what happened at all. In a lot of cases with the dieting people, it's because their body is trying to bounce back after that and it's trying to get itself back to normal. Okay, so what happens sometimes when people are on their initial diet, or actually, let me take a second and look at this, make sure nobody said anything. Yeah, I got this like sideways here. Um, so whenever people are kind of doing their initial diet and uh, they haven't had all that crazy complex stuff happen, um, there's a couple things that you run into. And I've seen this a lot with clients recently. Um, there's a big psychological aspect to it. Um, as to like creating healthy habits, there's lack of knowledge. So if you're eating a bunch of stuff um, that is actually higher in calorie than you think it is, that's a big problem. Um, I have had clients that have logged their calories. This is also, it's not knowing how to use technology. I have had clients that have logged their uh, meals into apps like MyFitnessPal and they log them incorrectly. They choose the wrong entry. And like this person was eating like, a whole avocado and they were putting it as like a third of an avocado and it's saying that they're only eating like 30 calories or something crazy i'm like you're eating like a whole avocado this is wrong so there, that's part of it too is like not not understanding how many calories you're actually taking in so understanding is one big part of it the habits being in the habit of trying to eat um in a deficit consistently that's another part of it so kind of those two things kind of go hand in hand the third thing which is the complicated thing is binging I've seen this a whole bunch with clients recently, and it's nothing on them. It doesn't make them bad people. It's just that's one of the struggles. So whenever people are trying to diet, this goes along with the psychology thing. Um, when they're trying to diet, if they develop, like, mental complexities, I guess, with their food, um, well, let me, let me tell you this. I, I read this years ago, which I think is just incredible. So there's more and more research showing that if you make something off limits for yourself, you want it that much more. So if you say um, you cannot have chocolate, you may not have craved chocolate at all prior to now, but from here on out, you're not allowed to have chocolate. Now all of a sudden it's like that is on your mind. Putting that boundary on yourself, it's like it makes you want it that much more. Um, so that's a big problem. It's like telling someone, okay, all this crap food that you've been eating, you can't eat any of it anymore. Now you have to eat only these foods. It makes it a lot harder to stay on track. That's why gradual habit change is the best. Um, so there's, there's that aspect. Um, and what will happen often is that a person will be on a diet and they will do an okay job at being somewhat consistent, um, with the diets, so like maybe like Monday through Friday afternoon, they're really, really good and they stay on point with their calories. And then Friday night they go out to eat and eh, they end up eating like, you know, they maybe their total, total, total caloric intake for the day is supposed to be like 2000 calories. And they've already eaten like 800, 900 by afternoon. Then they go out to eat and they have a few too many drinks and then they just keep on eating dessert and they end up taking in 2,000 calories in one sitting. I'm just going to tell you, I couldn't do that, but some people can. So they're at like 2,900 calories for that day. They're supposed to only take in 2,000 calories. And then on Saturday, their husband wants to take them out to eat breakfast. So then they eat this huge friggin' breakfast at IHOP and they got all these pancakes and just that one meal by itself is like, I don't know, 900, 1,000 calories. And then they go out for lunch and then they want to do something for dinner and then they end up at like three or 3,000 3, or 3,500 calories on Saturday. And then on Sunday, they're like, well, the last two days have sucked. I'm just going to start over tomorrow. I'm just going to eat whatever I want today. So they lounge around the house. They don't really expend any energy. And they just end up eating and eating and eating the whole day on Sunday where they make it, once again, like 3,000 or 3,500 calories. And money rolls around. And then they're trying to drop back down to that deficit again. But it's like you have undone like 
four and a half days worth of progress because you way overdid it on the weekend. Now, doing it that like one day or one meal, it's actually not that big of a deal. Your body will adapt to it and will usually like knock it back off. The problem is, is what like, when that that weekend scenario, when that's what's when that is what is happening like every single weekend or every week. If a person is, um, this happens a lot with shift workers. If you uh, are pretty consistent throughout the week or throughout the majority of your time, sorry, I gotta count. <laughs> your belt raises. If you're really consistent the majority of the time, but then you pass by like your favorite bakery and you're like, I'm really hungry, let me go eat this brownie. Sometimes it sets you off either for that meal or for the rest of the day and you end up having these binge fests. So what often happens is people will come in. This is, this is just another aspect. People will say, well, I don't understand. I, I'm dieting and I'm eating, you know, at a calorie deficit, but I, you know, I might have like a, tre- a treat or two, but I don't understand why I'm not losing weight. Once again, not making fun of anybody. It's just just something that happens all the time. It's to the point that I don't believe people anymore when they tell me that. So just by the way, if you're ever going to be a client of mine, I will listen, but I'm not going to believe you. Um, So they'll be like, I don't understand. I'm at a a calorie deficit. Why am I not losing weight? Well, it's because you're not at a calorie deficit. Remember, a calorie deficit has a run over a long period of time. It's not just daily. I mean, it's good to tackle, tackle each meal, tackle each day, tackle each week, whatever. But overall, in the grand scheme of things, if you're not ending up in what would, what your body would need as a calorie deficit, it isn't going to matter. Your weight might go like this, but it's not going to go down. So binging is a big, big aspect. Um, the last one that I can think of right now, why you wouldn't be gaining weight and why it's not starvation mode. Hold on, let me count. I swear there's like a squirrel running above my head and it keeps distracting me. I don't know what number I'm on now. Eight, I think. Nine. Ten. And twelve. Okay. Um, so the last one that I can think of would be it's kind of that knowledge thing again. So kind of going back to the first one a little bit, but I just kind of thought of it. I want to put some more in depth. So it's almost like, um, hmm, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know what word to use for this. It's like you are eating, you know, you drink a coffee for, for, for breakfast, you eat a stuff for lunch and you have like and some rice for dinner. Right. So you're just thinking, Oh, those are really simple. It's not like, it's not pizza. It's not a hamburger. I didn't eat donuts. So those are, I mean, those are healthy foods. I had, you know, an acai bowl or something for breakfast or some fancy schmancy crap. Um, but if those quote healthy foods end up being higher in calories, um, then yeah, you would not be able to lose weight. So for example, um, I saw this, there's some really this is how I had to store my barbell because the ceiling is really low. My barbell was sideways. Um, so, so he Lee actually puts out some really good graphics that demonstrate this idea. So if a person says, oh, I drank just a coffee, just like a black coffee is like 30 calories, maybe. But a coffee from Starbucks that's got all the things in it could be up to like 500, 700 calories. Like for real, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff and a lot of sugar and a lot of fat. That is two completely different things. So that's kind of a knowledge thing again, but it's almost like understanding what's in your food. Um, let's see, a salad could be a salad with like vegetables and like a vinaigrette, or it could be like a salad with like all kinds of stuff in it and tons of like nuts, which by the way, people think trail mix is great for losing weight. It's great to eat, but it ain't that great for losing weight because nuts have a lot of calories, by the way. Um, so it could be covered in that. It could be covered in like some kind of creamy dressing. And if you're like a crazy dressing person and you're putting the ranch dressing all over your salad, well then, yeah, it would bump your calories up on that salad like really, really high. Um, and then if it was like chicken and rice, but it was like, I don't know, fried chicken and you had some crazy stuff in your rice or you ate dirt that you forgot about. <laughs> All of those things add up in the long run. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. It's not just I ate healthier than I usually do, so I'm good. Oh, the side bowl thing. All right. That's a loud bird. Um, so once again, just because you're eating a food that's healthy, that's another thing. Just because it is supposed to be inherently healthy, that doesn't mean that it's lower in calories. 
it might have a lot of micronutrients, and that's really good. And there's nothing wrong with eating something that is a little higher in calories sometimes. And can, do you mind? Um, there's nothing wrong with eating something that's healthy, that's higher in calories and higher in micronutrients sometimes. But you have to also remember what long-term goals were. And I kind of talked about this on the last podcast thingy I did where I said, you know, there were, my teacher presented this idea in college, like, do you have someone eat vegetables regardless of what form they come in, or do you have them just skip them overall because they're not going to eat them unless they're slathered in butter and to- super high in calories? Depends on the person, depends on the situation, depends on the goal and the calorie deficit that they need and all that kind of stuff. But just keep in mind, just because you're eating healthy or eating clean, in quotes, I got a burp. doesn't mean you're going to lose weight. So, yeah, so long, long story short, starvation mode doesn't exist. Stop saying it. It's never going to exist. It doesn't work that way. Law of thermodynamics will exist whether you like it or not. Your body cannot pull energy from the sky and the stars and put it into your body. It doesn't make you a lesser person just because you don't know what you're doing or because you can't lose weight or you don't know what's going on. Sometimes you need some extra guidance in order to be able to do that. That's why there's personal trainers. That's why there's dietitians. That's why there's people out there who are trying to work with people and teach them all this stuff about losing weight because sometimes it's hard to do it on your own. It's hard to be able to analyze what you're doing on your own. And it's, it's, it's nice to have that third eye view. Okay, somebody commented, so I'm coming to read. No, okay, so question from a client. Referencing something you said earlier about inputting the wrong calorie information for food, could you explain, like, the avocado situation so a third of the avocado has the same calories as a whole? No, what I'm saying he was doing, uh, what he was doing is when he was inputting his calories into my fitness pal, um, he was putting in the portion sizes incorrectly. He was eating a whole avocado, which is, like, depending on the size, could be, like, 150 to 200 calories. He was recording it as like a third of an avocado. So he was only recording like 30 to 50 calories. He was eating almost 200. That was just one example that I had to get onto him multiple times about. So it's, it's, it's about knowing what's in your food and knowing how big the portion is supposed to be whenever you go to record it. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. So, um, and that can happen in a lot of cases. That's one of the issues with my fitness pal. And like, it's good because it does give really specific numbers. And it's, as, as, a, as a trainer and a coach for me, it's nice to be able to like uh, look at someone's log and be able to see those numbers and um, uh, be able to give like really specific instructions on how to change things. The problem is that no matter what route you go. Uh, logging calories is going to be, it's going to have its level of inaccuracy. It's honestly, it's all about really habit change anyway. And that's why at the end of the day, it's like, it's like this nihilism, like, does any of it actually matter? <laughs> it kind of does. It kind of doesn't. So, um, yeah, if, if you are trying to be specific, you have to try to choose entries in, um, uh, tracking apps that are as similar to what you're eating as you can. The problem with that is that you can really overanalyze. So I personally, I cannot track with my fitness pal. I have done it and I will do it on occasion just to have a feel for what I'm, how much I'm eating. But overall, my personality, I can't do it because I will like really overanalyze what I'm doing and I will like freak if it's not perfectly on point. Some people are like that and it becomes so overwhelming that they just, they just give up and they don't, um, they don't log at all. So, um, some people will just kind of throw stuff in there and they don't really care how accurate it is. So I think there's like a, a nice middle ground somewhere. If you can, um, if you can try to be as accurate as you can without overthinking it, that's a great place to be. Personally, I'm not there. I have different thing as different markers that I use for, t- um, monitoring calorie intake. And actually I have a lot of clients that have different methods too. I have some people that use my fitness pal and they like that and it's super simple and they scan their barcodes and they're good to go. I have some clients that that doesn't work for them. They have so many food photos. I have some clients that just do check boxes and check off like, yep, I ate this today. I'm good. So every person is a little bit different. And that's why I'm saying, you know, for some people, it is nice to have a trainer or a coach who's actually watching and seeing what you're doing because they're kind of looking over your shoulder, not to shame you, but to teach you. And that way, um, you're able to take a step away from saying things like starvation mode. Also another aspect of that, um, 
I think that a lot of times, I gotta see what I have to do next. Oh, I have calf stuff. Calves. Who needs calves? Not white girls. Just kidding. I'll do them in a minute. Um, I think that sometimes we, unfortunately, uh, don't want to take responsibility for our actions. This is going to be kind of harsh. Um, and I'm saying this to myself, too, because I have my own struggles. Mine are just the opposite of some people's. Sometimes we don't take responsibility for ourselves. And um, we want to blame it on something that we can't control. So if we say starvation mode, in quotes, um, starvation mode made me do it. <laughs> when I was in fourth grade, a guy, a, a boy acted really badly in class, and our teacher asked him, well, well, why did you do that? He's like, the devil made me do it. I was like, what? <laughs> take, take responsibility for yourself. So um, uh, I think if we can take a step back and be like, okay, I'm not going to blame this on something else. I'm going to see what kind of things I can control. I'm going to increase my knowledge so that I can see where my responsibility lies. Um, that's another big step into healing. And that's not just with food. That's actually with everything. So I'm going to get a little philosophical here for a second. Any struggle in life, if you can see where your responsibility lies, not to um, shame yourself, but to be able to not place blame, but almost like um, troubleshoot, like see what it is that you can control, what you can fix, um, I think you will start to feel empowered. Um, and and that's, um, that's an argument from, um, oh gosh, what's that speaker's name? I'll remember him in a minute. Anyway, um, if you can start to see where your responsibility lies, then once you're able to start making ste taking steps to improve the things that you can improve it's actually Im improve it's more empowering so even though you've struggled a long time if you can say okay well these are some areas that i can probably improve upon even though i don't like the idea that it's maybe my fault maybe it is my fault but once you start to make those changes you actually feel really good about yourself so you're building your self-efficacy at the same time that you're improving your health you're improving your habits um, but you're also learning a little bit of humility and learning to take responsibility for yourself I can say that one area I struggle in is I, uh, I want to focus too much on all the busy stuff and I don't take time to relax and slow myself down in order to be able to have enough of a calm stomach to be able to eat. That's actually my responsibility. It's not because everything's crazy. It's not because I'm overwhelmed. It's not because my husband won't help me with our business, which is, that's not true at all. Um, it's not those things. I have to take responsibility for the fact that I have to learn to set my boundaries for my work and I have to learn to make myself more calm and, and take the time to like chill out so that I don't have as much struggles with my weight. So that's areas that I'm working on too. So maybe I'll end this by saying, if you can try to not use those types of excuses, but instead, like, asking questions, those are great. Like, asking, like, is starvation mode real? Is that why I can't lose weight? It's fine to ask. But also, once you learn, then taking that responsibility on yourself and being able to make those changes on your own. So, um, yeah, that turned, that was like a, but it wasn't as bad as Tuesday, so... <laughs> Hopefully that helps, somebody. If you guys have more questions, I'm going to try to save this on my Instagram. Um, if you guys have more questions, if you watch this later, you're welcome to send me a message. And I'm going to try to publish this and turn it into an actual audio podcast. I'm still working on that. So, um, yeah. If you have any discussions you want me to hear next time while I'm lifting weights, <coughs> while I'm lifting weights, feel free to send me a message. Bye, guys.